You are listening to the Next Play Podcast, the playbook for high-performing leaders who want to exceed their full potential. From walking on the Ole Miss football team at 5'7", 150 pounds, and earning a full D1 scholarship, to coaching thousands around the world and working with massive organizations like IBM, I've learned countless lessons that I'll be sharing right here with you. Join me as I interview some of the most successful people so you too can learn how to focus on always moving forward by deciding, planning, and executing on the next play relentlessly. This is Richie Contartesi with the Next Play Podcast, and today I have a very special guest for you, someone that I've known for, what is it, six six years? Probably like 10 years. 10 years. Yeah, all the way back from my actually second job out of college, somebody who started as a recruiter, which is going to tell us a really good story, and all the way up to the manager of human resources for a company called NRG Energy, actually a company that um, I'd spoken at, I think maybe four or five years ago, um, at Green Mountain specifically, but um, he's worked his way up. He's a Sherm professional. He's got an amazing philosophy on leadership, which is obviously what we talk about, how to hire, grow, and retain your people. So super excited to have Matt on the show. Matthew Orlando, thanks thanks for being here. Thanks, Richie. Glad awesome. to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. So we were kind of sharing that story with me of how you – got into business and how you became a recruiter to start. So walk me through that. It's, it's actually pretty funny. Yeah. So a little roundabout. So um, I had gotten a college degree in broadcasting um, from a small school in Northern New Jersey in 2005. So I'm aging myself here too. Um, and um, shortly after graduation, I had gotten a job um, in uh, at a radio station, actually right down the road from where I am today in Princeton. And I was working in promotions um, and I had gotten a degree in, you know, broadcasting communications, thought I was going to be, you know, on WFAN, Mike and the Mad Dog, Sports Center, doing play by play football, whatever the case may be. Um, and um, had started that radio job and promotions, moved to working for a TV station in North Jersey and master control. And the master control job was great, but didn't pay much, kind of had some crazy hours. I was doing early mornings, weekends, overnights. And I had gotten to the point where I had said, well, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to be on SportsCenter or doing play-by-play for the Giants, right? So yeah. maybe it might be a good idea to maybe at least, you know, look around and sort of see what else is out there. I had walked into a branch of Manpower, which is a pretty large, you know, light industrial administrative clerical type staffing agency in the U.S., actually internationally. And I had met with a regional manager there. And we had got to talking and I had told her about what I was doing and the career transition that I was looking to make. And she had said to me, what do you think about doing this? And I had said, well, wh- like, you know, literally like, what, what is this? Right. Yeah. And so the next thing I knew I was working for manpower in that office is what the time they call the staffing specialist. And that was 12, 13 years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of an interesting thing. I had no, you know, I didn't get an HR degree. I had no background in HR. Um, I'd like to consider myself somewhat of a people person, right? And um, so I think that that was a good, you know, career transition for me to make. And uh, lo and behold, 12, 13 years later, I've kind of continued down the HR path, doing some different things between the recruiting work, HR generalist work, HR business partner work. It's been a pretty good ride, but uh, kind of started all, basically a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. So he walked into manpower, which, so, so we, we worked at K4. So manpower is essentially a competitor, right? That's right. That's right. Yep. So you walked in thinking they were going to help get you a temp job, (laughs) but you ended, so, so you ended up working there. Um, And then, so walk me through how you went from being a recruiter all the way up to being the manager of HR at NRG energy. So, you know, to be honest with you, Richie, NRMG has afforded me a pretty good opportunity, right? So um, I had started with the company in May of 2016. I actually started four weeks after my first uh, child was born. Um, So that kind of worked out pretty well for me to find, you know, a pretty solid employer, you know, after having my first kid. And so I'd started out as a lead recruiter and, and what I was doing was supporting our corporate client groups nationwide. So administration, finance, and you know, the, the corporate groups. 
Um, and I had been in the job for about a year or so, and I was supporting two senior HR managers that were also supporting those corporate client groups as HR business partners. And we had got to talking and built a relationship and I had expressed an interest in kind of doing that HR generalist work and it had gotten approved by my manager and obviously theirs. And so they kind of took me under their wing with, you know, sort of the light, you know, generalist kind of tasks, you know, the administrative stuff, nothing yeah. where I could do too much damage. Right. And um, probably about a year after that, um, there was an opening that had popped up um, under the actual recruiting manager that I was reporting into. And it kind of got interesting. The conversation was me sort of recruiting to sort of backfill that job for her. And it became, a, you know, are you going to apply? Well, do you want me to apply? Well, I think uh. I should apply. And that's a, right. And so that transition had been made um, in October of 2018. So, you know, to be honest with you at the time, right, if I would have taken my resume with the recruiting experience and I would have tried to apply for an HR generalist or HR business partner or HR manager type job at that resume, I don't know that I could have gotten it, maybe at a, like a small company, but probably not at a, you know, Fortune 250 company like NRG with, you know, 6,000 plus employees, right? So right. NRG had afforded me a great opportunity with, you know, giving me that, that chance um, in that role. Three and a half years later, I've supported, um, I currently support our market operations group, which is, you know, the trading function. Um, I support NRG business, which is our B2B sales. Um, it's about 600 employees that I support directly and about, um, about 900 employees in total between the two groups. Um, it's been great, man. Every day is completely different. Um, I've had the opportunity to toggle back and forth between the generalist work, the recruiting work. I've had a direct report. Um, it's, it's been a pretty good ride, man. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. And that you've, you've stuck with it and you've moved up the ladder. I mean, that's, that's what it's about. Right. So walk me through a little bit, um, about your support when it comes to leaders throughout the company. Right. And you could start with the, you know, the B, so the B2B team, you said there's about 600 people. Yeah, so I support um, basically three groups within a business segment that at NRG we call NRG business. So it's our B2B sales, commercial and industrial type customers. Um, and specifically, I'm the HR business partner for our sales organization within that NRG business function. We have it regionalized. Um, the three regions are Texas. So there's, you know, we have a huge business yeah. in Texas. Yeah. Um, the West and the east, right? So the west is basically everything from, I guess, about the Mississippi River west, other than yeah. Texas. And then the east is everything in the east, primarily, you know, the northeast, let's say from Virginia north. Um, it's fantastic. It's all the account executives, um, you know, the, the folks out there in the field. Obviously, there's, you know, kind of sales support folks that support those AEs. So, you know, I could kind of get granular with it, but uh, yeah, it's great. So it's all of our, it's all of our salespeople. So it's, it's a lot of fun. So how do you, so, so what's your, like, how do you support them at, from a leadership perspective? Like, how do you work with either the leadership team to, to support them? What have you seen that works? Like what's your, your process there? Yeah. So, you know, not to take, so let's, so without, let's say taking you behind the curtain completely, but for just sure. sort, of yeah, yeah. At, at, sort of like a surface level, right? One of the things that I've tried to do, whether I was a recruiter, HR business partner, or basically anything HR wise or, or not, right. You know, I want to make sure that they know that I'm reliable, I'm dependable, I'm accountable, I'm responsive, right. That I can right. be trusted, that I'm a good listener, that I, you know, uh, do what I say and say what I do. So I think part of it's just those intangibles as a professional, kind of who you are and how you want to show up sort of every day, right? right? I think that's where it starts, right? Is that relationship building, right? Because the folks that I support, let's say they're at a, you know, I mean, I support folks all the way up to senior vice presidents, even an executive vice president of operations, right? You know, those people are the smartest people in the room, right? If they're coming to you and they want to have a conversation, right? It's typically about something that they need some help with um, or an opinion, or it's something that they haven't come across. So it's probably not that easy. There's probably right. a level of complexity <laughs> to it, right? Where, they, where sure. they sort of need help. And so building that sort of rapport with them and reputation where they want to come to you and have that conversation and believe that you could add some value to them 
I think is uh, is kind of important, right? But you have to build that. That's, that doesn't happen instantaneously. Hey, Matt's your HR business partner, you know, let him into your world, right? You kind of have to build and sort of develop that, right? Um, so that's the first thing. I think the second thing is just, um, I'd like to think I'm a pretty good listener, right? So, you know, the business ultimately makes the decisions, Richie. It's not HR, right? HR is a partner to the business to help them make good decisions, you know, to, you know, ideally put them in the best positions possible with employees or strategy or whatever they're sort of doing, you know, at times even keep folks out of jail sort of thing, right? So to speak, right? But, um, um, you know, the business is, you know, we're, we support the business. We don't dictate to the business. It's a little bit more of the other way around, right? So I think kind of keeping that that context to say like, hey, I'm, I'm a partner to you. I'm an advisor to you. I'm counsel for you. Um, I'm not going to try to dictate to you, right? I think is another, you know, sort of important thing. Um, and and a, a lot of time, right, is helping managers manage, yeah. right? There's different questions that pop up that they don't necessarily know the answer to. Hey, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? Or this is something that popped up. Um, you know, how should I sort of handle this? And, you know, not to get into any level of detail, but and NRG is a great company, right? I mean, this is not a representation of the people. I think this is just any company, right? Crazy stuff pops up sometimes. I mean, things that you sure. haven't dealt with, things that can't be, um, you know, there isn't a policy for, yeah. right? That everything is in a black and white where you kind of have to think on your right. feet or sort of put yourself in somebody else's shoes or sort of intuitively say like, how would I sort of handle this? What is, what it kind of makes sense? So. As far as, as far as supporting leaders, I think it's kind of those intangible characteristics of, of you as a professional. How do you want to show up? How do you want to build the relationship? I think it's, you know, knowing your role, right? You're the advisor, you're the counsel, you're not dictating to them, right? And the third thing I think is kind of putting those two things together, just trying to consistently, you know, every day continue to build that credibility, give the good advice, you know, be the right person that they could sort of lean on for a variety of different things when you know a lot of times they kind of say right like when somebody doesn't know where to go or what to do they go to hr mm-hmm. right. right when it's something that nobody you know what do i do with this i don't know go to hr right, right. so it's a lot of that kind of stuff it's it's <laughs> it's a it's a cool job it's a lot of fun i think you brought up a good point and i i kind of want to dive into this one and that's that's that a lot of times they're they're coming to you because they're unsure of how to handle something, right? And so you have to be the one to kind of dissect the situation and figure out, hey, what is the best solution, right? Which is something that a lot of leaders sometimes struggle with. So what's your process? How do you go about doing that yourself in general? And then, you know, because I'm just thinking in terms of if I'm in a leadership role and I don't know how to handle something, what what's your process for being able to do that so that I could execute that the next time around? Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, the first thing to be honest, right, is that there's no substitute for experience, right? So hopefully, right, you know, and, and, and you know, pretty regularly, right, somebody comes to you about something that's new for them, but not necessarily new for you. So that is a good advantage, right? The other thing is, you know, sometimes, you know, you need to kind of step back and you don't necessarily have the answer in that immediate conversation. Somebody comes to you for something. I mean, I have to think, right. I might need a second. I might not have the answer right then. So, you you know, you go back, you think about it. Maybe you have a conversation with somebody else or kind of jogs your memory. Hey, how did I handle this before? What's something similar that I've come across in the past? Sometimes it's something that you might have to sleep on. Right. Yeah. So I think one of the, I think the things is to not rush to any decisions, right? If you know that you're kind of getting into a situation where it's a pretty complex kind of thing, um, I think it's best to sort of, you know, think it through, not rush to kind of um, make any quick decisions. And I always think it's right too, where, you know, if there's multiple people involved or you need somebody else's opinion to be willing to have those other conversations, right? especially like if it comes to an employee discipline kind of thing, Hey, something might happen. It might seem open and shut. This is what we would do. Probably should have a conversation with the employee should have conversations maybe with the other employees that would have been involved or there was conversations had with them, whatever the case may be. So I think it's taking your time, being thorough, thinking things through, right. Or probably, and not rushing to judgment 
and probably some key elements sort of right up front. Um, and again, you know, there's no substitute for experience, right? If you can kind of pull from prior experience, similar instances, um, I think those are important. If you kind of do both of those things, that puts together a pretty good formula as far as how to deal with, with some tough situations. So one of the big things that a, a lot of organizations are struggling with right now, and we were talking about this a little beforehand, is, is that hiring piece, right? And I think... You know, a lot of times it's go to HR, you know what I mean? Um, but they're the leadership and the management, they must be responsible because at the end of the day, they're the ones that have to, it's the, the tables have turned. They're the ones that have to get people to want to be a part of their team, um, that they can lead them to achieve what they want in their life, right? So what are you seeing that really works from a hiring perspective of top talent at a time when it's really hard to attract and, and hire top talent? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think the key right now is differentiation, right? So, you know, you know, emphasizing your brand, who are you? What do you stand for? What do you want to be? Who are you, what are you about, right? You know, your brand, your culture, hey, you know, we know who we are. We're fast paced, we're go-getters, we're innovative, right? Whatever that is, right? So your brand, your culture. And the other thing too is tangibly, right? To be able to compete, right? Like, you know, do you have a pulse on what's going on outside of your company? What other companies are offering? What other companies are doing for employees, right? And not that every company can offer what Google and Amazon can, right? But think about what, you know, is reasonable and realistic for you to be able to sort of do for employees so that, when push comes to shove and they have two offers in front of them, they're taking yours, right? There's some sort of a differentiator that you, you know, you want to compete. You have some things that you have at your disposal that allow you to compete, right? You know, again, within reason, right? But yeah. those are probably the few things, right? Is sort of not just focusing on like, hey, here's the job description that's in front of the person. This is what we're looking for in an employee. It's also like in that job description, in that job posting, Here's a, here's a link to our website that talks more about our brand and our culture and our offerings and whatever the case may be, or even in that description. This is what we're looking for in this role in terms of sort of the soft skills, the intangibles, yeah. whatever, right? Um, so that the person on the other side could sort of feel like, okay, I'm, pretty, I'm getting a pretty good feel of what this company is all about. You know, this kind of aligns with, you know, who I am, who I want to work for, what I want in sort of a culture and a brand and you know, to be part of my life. Right. Um, yeah. So I think one of the big things right now is that differentiation and honestly, the brand and the culture piece, right. Some companies are bigger than others. And, you know, you bring in a marketing department or something like that, right. Where, you know, those type of professionals, they know how to sort of frame that up the right way. But, um, you know, it's that differentiation, Richie, uh, you know, to compete, I think you have to kind of sell yourself just as much as a candidate sort of selling themselves yeah. to you, like in an interview, I think you got to sell yourself to the candidates a little bit up front more than maybe in the past with the, the market out competitive it is. For sure. There, there's no way around that. So, so as far as the differentiator, I, I mean, I, obviously you, you've got to be able to do that just like how it used to be where they need to differentiate themselves, right? Cause you might have multiple offers. So what do you think is a good way to differentiate yourself as a, as a company, or even if you're the one doing the interview as the leader to get them to be like, I've got to work for this person? Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny, right? Because like, I think that NRG and from the recruiting experience, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've had here and sort of the, you know, the job requisitions and the managers I've dealt with and candidates and positions I filled. I mean, I did it for a long time. and I think I did a pretty good job at it. You know, I was always a pretty, I wasn't the greatest sorcerer. I couldn't find you like the purple squirrel. That wasn't kind of my deal, right? But as far as like managing relationships with the candidates, managing relationships with the managers, you know, um, kind of getting a good feel of what their needs were, understanding the business, right? I was a good like matchmaker. Yeah. And I was good at kind of keeping the process tight and the timelines, you know, you know, not too, you know, not big Crazy. gaps in the process, lack of response, you know, that, that whole sort of, so that I was, that I was very good at. I think what I would say to like leaders and managers would be, you know, think strategically about what the hiring process is going to be before you actually get into it. Right. So in other words, 
really think about that job description. What do you really want to put out there to market? Once it's out there and now you're looking at resumes, how does that resume actually match for that description, right? You said that you needed this, you know, try to get everything to be sort of cohesive, right? When you have a candidate and you want to speak with them, think about what questions you're going to ask and why you're going to ask them and ask them sort of consistently, right? If a candidate is going to come on site for an interview or nowadays a lot of video interviews and now they're going to meet with, you know, multiple people, have a meeting before that interview and say, hey, Richie, you know, you're going to talk to the candidate about their technical skills and Matt's going to talk to them about, you know, culturally where they think they fit in and Bill's going to talk about them about, you know, their short and long term career advancement plans and Joey's going to talk to them about, right, and sort of all of the candidates that come in, Richie's always going to talk about the technical and Matt's always going to talk about the cultural and we're going to consistently come with that approach so there's no redundancy in terms of what the candidates being asked. We can all, you know, be able to assess, right? Hey, I focused on this and this is why, this is how I rank this candidate over that candidate over that candidate. And this is why, right? So when we come back to the table, right? There is some sort of, you know, we can sort of quantify, right? Why we selected sort of who we selected. I think that that's a great thing to do. And then the other thing is the actual onboarding process, right? So now this person's accepted this offer and they're going to start with the company. You know, really sit down and think about and put down on a piece of paper, even an Excel spreadsheet or whatever, some sort of list of all of the things that you need to do as a manager to make sure that they're prepared when they walk in on day one, that they have what they need. And then think about, you know, the first day, the first week, the first month, the first whatever, and all of the things that you want to do to help them get onboarded. Because if you go through the recruiting process the right way and you, and you think you brought the right person in, and then you get them onboarded the right way, that goes a long way rather than, hey, you know, I didn't do the greatest job at the interview. I don't really know this person that well. They walked in the door, uh, you know, they're always coming back to me with different questions on different needs that they have that, you know, we never got them fully, you know, um, onboarded and prepared for, right? I think just a really strategic and a well thought out recruiting and onboarding process kind of goes a long way both in terms of, you know, your own satisfaction with who you brought in and that person being productive and happy and whatever the case may be, but from a candidate experience perspective, that's completely within a, within a hiring manager or leader's control. Right. And so do you, do you feel like there's just in your experience, not just in NRG, but across the board, do you feel like there's, there's a certain, there's a system that works when it comes to like a farm system or a hiring system that, that with an onboarding process, right? Because don't, I mean, are there times where they just create a position because they need it filled and there is no onboarding process and the hiring process is kind of like send some resumes, we'll do some interviews, then they get started in two weeks. Like walk yeah. me through what you feel you're seeing works. Is there a, is there a hiring system, like almost like a pipeline or like, what are you seeing that that's working? Yeah. So I think from a, from an HR perspective, I think what works is taking a step back from the actual hiring sort of in the immediate and sort of like the reactive need, right. And saying like, okay, so let's sit down, you know, as a business with our HR person and let's go through a talent assessment. Let's go through some sort of succession planning, right. And not that you're going to go through that talent assessment and that succession planning, you're going to say and be able to map out if XYZ person leaves, I have ABC person that's going to, you know, fill in their spot. But at least by going through that process, you know what you do and don't have. Got it. Got it. So that if somebody leaves, then you know, okay, this is a, this is a, this is a position that we're going to have a gap or this isn't a position that we're gonna have a gap. We know that we have Bill and, and, and uh, Joey and Betty, right? That we're gonna be able to kind of tap on the shoulder and know that that's the next you know, step for them and see if they're interested and start having those conversations, right? So I think, I think the first step is sort of to know what you have and don't have in terms of talent within your organization. That's the first place to start, right? Yeah. And then the idea is, so then once you go to market, right? If you've done it sort of the right way, right? Not that the, um, I mean, pretty consistently, right, as far as the onboarding process in terms of equipment and access and the badge and, you know, a place to sit. I mean, all that stuff for every employee are always going to need that. 
it's then beyond that, you know, maybe this person needs access to a little bit of a different system. Who are they, who do they need to meet with? Who are they going to shadow? What documentation do they need to have to learn the job? You know, that's going to be different. But the whole idea of making sure that you're prepared with those kinds of things, I think is key, right? So you kind of go through the talent assessment, the succession planning, know what you have, right? Know what you need or you're gonna need if something happens. And then having that kind of plan as far as like recruiting and onboarding. So it kind of would go sort of in that order. And you, do you feel like that, that plan, that post, that post hiring, is that better when it's created by, from HR or from the actual hiring manager? That's a good question. I would, I would definitely say from the business, right? I think HR can provide you checklists of all the things that you need to think about in terms of, like I had mentioned, right? You know, like, you know, your ID badge, your equipment, your, you know, but the business would know like, hey, you know, strategically within the first, you know, week, I'd like this person to meet with these people. And this is sort of why, or I'd need them to attend this training. Right. right? And this is right. Um, So it's a partnership. I think HR kind of probably needs to handle sort of the X and O's, you know, blocking and tackling kind of stuff to make sure that somebody comes in the door, but it would be the business to kind of make sure the person's well prepared, let's say beyond that. I couldn't tell, you know, I couldn't tell my, uh, you know, the gas trading team, like, hey, you know, these are the meetings, these are the training, right, like they, right, would have right. to, they would have to know that. For Here's the softwares you need to learn. And that's right. So, so as far as the, on the retention side, what, what are you seeing? Like, obviously that's an uh, opposite of hiring is we have retention like we were trying to keep people so what are you seeing working from from your perspective what do you feel is a, is a good strategy to put in place yeah so i think it's so i think it maybe is kind of similar right it's proactive and not reactive right so if you're having those talent assessment meetings and you're knowing what you have and knowing what you don't have and knowing who your key players are right it's kind of identifying you know those critical pieces and basically saying so you know, when's the last time they got an increase? You know, where are they comped in terms of market? You know, when's the last time they were promoted? What conversations have we had with them about their career interests and sort of their trajectory? What do they want out of the job? You know, like all those kinds of things is really like being able to say, okay, if on an ongoing basis, you really know where you are with your, you know, with your people in totality, right? there wouldn't be any surprises as far as what needs to be done, what the next step with them sort of is, whether it's, Hey, they need a little bit of a bump. Hey, you know, they haven't, you know, what about a title change? What about, you know, why don't we give them this little different responsibility? You know, they said that they were interested in managing people, you know, I think they would be good at that, but they need more experience. Let's see if we can kind of restructure things to, you know, maybe give them some of that experience. So from a retention standpoint, I think it's a level of proactivity, right? It's an ongoing thing, right? Um, as far as like assessing your talent, you know, your people, your needs, right? Um, and trying to be as, you know, non-reactive sort of as possible. Right. Um, and then you get into situations where you need to be reactive and you just kind of need to do what you need to do. But I think a level of proactivity is probably the key for, for retention. So it doesn't get to the point that they're submitting their resignation letter and you're saying now, like, what are we going to do? How did that happen? So how do you how do you kind of support the 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 managers in that aspect? How do you like do you have like a specific process that you do like hey just like did, have you gone through their career goals? Have you do you do something like that or is that really more on them? Yeah, so I mean it varies from client to client in terms of like sort of what they want to do, right? I mean different people think about things different ways and are a little bit more comfortable than others or kind of have their foresight a little bit, you know, better than others. Right. Some want to get their HR person involved and they sit there with a spreadsheet and come up with sort of, you know, criteria that they would consider, you know, the, the key competencies for a particular position or for their group or whatever the case may be, and kind of go through a scoring system where each person is sort of ranked and, you know, we kind of sit down and we talk about, you know, who's who's uh, up for promotion this year, who needs a pay increase, you know, what about this, what about that, and other kind of stuff happens a little bit more organically, right, where you kind of deal with the same leaders on a pretty regular basis. I mean, I, you know, I'd like to think I know who, you know, our top talent is, right, we've had conversations about those people, and every now and then as you're meeting with a leader, or you're meeting with, you know, 
the next level down or whatever the case may be, right? You know, hey, you know, how's this person doing? You know, we haven't talked about them in a while, right? Just to kind of keep it at top of mind for them where, you know, if there was something going on or they said, you know, I haven't checked in with them a while in a while, right? Then they would sort of do that. So it's probably a combination, Richie, like, you know, formal versus informal, you know, from an HR perspective, we're well prepared to facilitate those more formal, you know, talent assessments or whatever type of conversation to make sure we have a good gauge on our people. But then there's also the ongoing more informal, like, hey, different things pop up, you know, let's have a conversation about this person or, you know, they spoke with somebody else and they started to express some level of need or displeasure or whatever the case may be where, you know, we want to kind of, you know, nip that in the bud before it becomes more of an issue sort of thing. Bang. So it's, it's right. a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit more of a combo. Got it. Cool, man. Well, this has been really, really insightful because having having an HR perspective, I think, is really important, especially from a in a from a leadership role. So, um, is there anything else around you know the areas of hiring and you know growing and retaining your people that you feel like we missed on that you would that you would want to share? I mean, the only other thing that comes to the top of mind, and I've I've been thinking about this kind of lately, right? To and the kind of keep it relatively simple, right? the two things I would sort of think about would be sort of equip and inspire, right? So in other words, you equip your people with, you know, the training, the tools, you know, um, all those kinds of things. And then you inspire with the compensation, you know, the work-life balance, the PTO, et cetera, right? And if you kind of keep that in mind that, you know, the combination of equip and inspire probably keeps a happy employee, a high productive, you know, a high producing team, retains the top talent, attracts the top talent, right? Equip and inspire. That's, that's I'm going with I like that. that. Simple Two two things. I might I'm, add I'm, I'm a simple man, it, Richie. But... I'm, a, I'm a simple man. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate you being on the show. I have one last question for you. What, what's your next play? Oh boy. Well, so hopefully my next play is just to continue to advance at NRG, right? So again, I mean, I've been with the company, it'll be going on six years in May. I've been afforded great opportunity, right? You know, I've been able to do some different things. I've been promoted, you know, I've been compensated fairly, the whole deal. So it would just to be to continue to progress here. Um, I've had, you know, my own development conversations with, you know, my management team. Um, I think all of those assessments are really fair. So I think it's, you know, just continue to build on, build myself, right, and uh, and do it here. So that's that's the game plan. Oh, man, well, congratulations on all the success you've already had, and uh, I look forward to to having you on on the show again in the future. And that when you get to that yes. next place, and then the next one, and we'll continue to learn from you. So I appreciate you uh, you being here and sharing your uh, your your knowledge. And and Richie, to keep it in college football or football parlance. <laughs> Move the chains. Yeah. Move the chains, pal. Oh, I like that. I got to start using that. Move, move the, the chains. chains. You, could, you could take it from me. Move the chains. <laughs> okay, cool. So I'll talk, I'll say in a talk, yeah, yeah. And don't forget to move the chains. Oh, by the way, I got that from Matt Orlando from NRG. <laughs> That's right. Give me cool. the credit. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you, Richie. Have a good one, buddy. You too. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Next Play Podcast. If you liked the show, make sure to leave us a review. For more resources, visit RelentlessUniversity.com or download the free Relentless University app. And if you're interested in having me speak at your next event, visit RelentlessRitchie.com. Until next time.